Hey YouTube, Marshall here. Welcome back to The Realignment. I've got a very timely episode considering the growing protests and questions of whether Iran is in the midst of what could turn into a revolution. I'm speaking with Reza Aslan about his new book, An American Martyr in Persia, The Epic Life and Tragic Death of Howard Baskerville. We're gonna be looking at a hundred years of revolution and protest in Iran through an American lens and the broader question of what America's role in the world should be and what our responsibilities or lack thereof when it comes to the spread of democracy. Hope you all enjoy this conversation. Reza Aslan, welcome to The Realignment. Thanks for having me. I'm uh, very excited for this conversation. Yeah, I'm really glad to chat with you. You're falling into a trend that I've noticed of late where you'll have an author spend a lot of time on a book and then the book's themes perfectly fit into <laughs> the news cycle. That yeah. theme being obviously the the protests in Iran right now. We're recording this a few weeks before the actual release of the book. So I don't want to time gate this too precisely, but can we just start with your broad thoughts on the protests that are happening in the country right now? What I can say with total confidence is that I have never seen anything like this before in Iran. We'll scratch that. The closest thing that I've ever seen to what's happening right now in Iran was in 1977, which is the start of the 79 revolution. Um, and I say that it, with the full understanding of the fact that there have been countless protests and uprisings in Iran over the last 40 years. And in fact, the last few months, I mean, yes, Americans are now starting to pay attention to what's happening in Iran because of the, the scale and the ferocity of the current protests. But Iran has been seeing protests by factory workers and farmers and retirees and pensioners and, uh, you know, people from all walks of life over the last few months, precisely because the economy is on the verge of total collapse. We're talking about a good half the population that lives under the poverty line, 50% inflation rate. Um, the, uh, the the president, Ibrahim Raisi, uh, a few months ago got rid of food subsidies. And so some basic food costs have jumped about 300%. And then what happened with Masa and Mini was sort of the last straw, if you will. What I think is truly different about what we're seeing right now in Iran and what we saw, for instance, say in 2009, is that in 2009, you had mostly peaceful demonstrations and marches uh, because of a stolen election. And whatever you want to say about the Green Movement, it never really managed to get too far beyond the major cities like Tehran. And it never really managed to pull in anyone other than sort of young, middle class, lower middle class um, kids, students. What we're seeing right now is a nationwide uprising. There have been not marches, you know, not uh, demonstrations, but violent uprising uh, taking place in at least 19 of the 31 provinces in Iran. So the majority of the provinces. Um, we are seeing men and women, poor and rich and middle class, older, younger, conservatives, uh, progressives, supporters of the regime, frankly, uh, have been coming out and saying enough is enough. Whatever happens, you know, only God knows, obviously. But what I can say as someone who lived through a revolution in Iran and has been watching uh, that country for the last four decades is that this is unlike anything that I have ever seen before. And that I think people should also recognize that although we are desperate for some kind of dramatic, you know, revolutionary moment where everything suddenly changes, that's not likely that more likely is that this is a marathon not a sprint that these protests are going to continue they're going to bring in more and more people now you're seeing the oil sector saying that they're going to go on strike if the if the crackdown on protesters doesn't stop um at a time in which already like i said the economy is in shambles and 
one thing that I don't think is talked about enough, and it might be a little bit inside baseball, but I think is probably the single most significant factor in the success or failure of the current revolution, is that the, the supreme leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, is a very, very ill man and could die at any minute, honestly. I mean, really. And there has been a lot of talk in Iran about how he has uh, been grooming his son, Mojtaba Khamenei, to take over his position, which is, the position itself is absurd, right? The, 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 the role of supreme leader is a joke. It's just something that Ayatollah Khomeini, the man who invented the position for himself, came up out of whole cloth and has no what do, you, what do you mean by a what do you mean by a joke do you mean from a legitimacy perspective from a response like what does that mean so shiism which is the majority religion in in iran is a messianic religion like christianity it believes that one day a promised restorer and in, in the case of shiism he's known as the mahdi a messianic figure will return to earth and create the perfect society and, and implant justice on the earth. And that until that time, all other governments are temporary and illegitimate. And as a result, that has led to 14 centuries of the Shia clergy, uh, essentially, uh, you know, sort of separating themselves from, from politics. You know, uh, Shiism is a, is, a, is a political quietist re uh, religion. What Khomeini did uh, in creating this position of the supreme leader in Iran is he had, frankly, an unprecedented interpretation of uh, what I just told you, this messianic notion, uh, one that might be familiar to some of your audiences who are familiar with sort of Christian millenarianism because it's the Islamic version of that, which is rather than sit around <clears throat> divorce ourselves from politics, waiting for the Mahdi to arrive and create the perfect society. Why don't we create the perfect society and then the Mahdi will arrive? And who better to create that society than the representatives of the Mahdi, the Ayatollahs? But not all the Ayatollahs, because Shiism is a profoundly, you know, it's a very diverse religion with lots of different viewpoints and ideas, very much like Judaism, right? One rabbi and another rabbi can have two vastly different ideas and no, there's no mechanism to say which rabbi is right. You just choose whichever one you like. That's what uh, Islam is like too. Khomeini's uh, innovation was not only should the, the clergy be in charge of society to make it perfect, but one clergy member, one person should be in charge. And not only should that one person be in charge, the highest religious authority is what he said, but that that one person should have the same infallible authority as the Mahdi. This was absolutely heretical. No one had ever said anything like this before. No one had ever thought anything like this before in 14 centuries of Shia thought. Um, but, you know, in post-revolutionary Iran in 1979, Khomeini's voice was the loudest and he managed to to silence all the other, uh, you know, religious voices who were basically calling this idea the craziest thing that ever heard. Um, and he made himself the supreme leader, despite the fact that he wasn't the highest religious authority in Iran, far from it. But, you know, he's Khomeini and he can do whatever he wants to. But then when Khomeini died... <laughs> Uh, at first, he had picked the highest religious authority, a man by the name of Grand Ayatollah Ali Montezeri, to be his successor. And Grand Ayatollah Ali Montezeri said, if you, if you pick me as a successor, my first act will be to dismantle this entire thing because it's heretical and mm -hmm. absurd. And so Khomeini, as you can imagine, changed his mind and picked this absolutely like mid-level cleric, not even an Ayatollah, let alone the highest religious authority um, named Ali Khamenei, uh, who was unanimously approved because, you know, he's the second guy. He's not going to rock the boat. He'll do whatever we tell him to do. Um, and now that man, that second supreme leader, the, the person who holds this, again, totally made up and clearly heretical title, 
uh, is about to die. And regardless of who becomes the third supreme leader, it, it it's going to completely water down that, that position anyway. But the fact that he thinks he's going to have his son, who is a low-level cleric, I mean, way down the, the hierarchy, the religious hierarchy, replace him, essentially is the Iranian government saying, you know what, we're just the Shahs now. That's the mm -hmm. same thing. You know, like we, this whole thing was to make up for, you know, a hereditary, uh, you know, monarch uh, that has no, you know, responsibilities to people whatsoever and absolute authority. And now that's what this is all has become. The, the Supreme Leader is now just another word for Shah. If that happens in the midst of these protests, well, then all bets are off already these young people who are protesting on the streets, already one of the most popular chants that we're hearing from them is, Mojtaba, Mojtaba, we will die before we see you as leader. Already. So if by chance, you know, Khamenei dies in the next, you know, few months while these protests are going, I think that's the spark that might make the entire thing crumble. So you know, we're all watching, we're all we're all wondering what's going to happen. But I, I think you can say with a lot of confidence that this is unprecedented, what's happening in Iran. That's that's fascinating. Something that I think will take us a bit to the book that I'm curious about is we're going all the way into the first decade of the 20th century. And it seems like other than France, I can't really think of another example of a country and nation where protest revolution has been so intertwined into the story. Like why starting with Baskerville's time, can we tell a story of Iran through revolutions and protests? Why is it so central? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, most people are probably unaware of the fact that Iran has had three massive, major nationwide revolutions in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we remember the 1979 revolution, which brought down the monarchy and replaced it ultimately with the Islamic Republic, what we see today. In 1953, there was another democratic uprising. Uh, it's called the Nationalist Revolution, in which a, a prime elected prime minister by the name of Mohammad Mossadegh took over the government. Uh, Iranians took to the streets, kicked the Shah out, uh, but of course, that revolution came to a swift end when the CIA uh, showed up to Iran with uh, a suitcase full of cash led by Kermit Roosevelt um, in what is now famously known as Operation Ajax, in which they uh, created a fake counter revolution, uh, removed Mossadegh from power and brought the Shah back in. And then, of course, the first revolution, which is the backdrop for this book, which is 1906 revolution, the constitutional revolution, which also happened to be the first democratic revolution in the Middle East, uh, a revolution that resulted uh, in a constitution and a parliament and for a very, very brief time turned Iran into a constitutional monarchy. But I think what's pivotal about that 1906 revolution is that while you know, ultimately it failed to transform Iran in any permanent way. Um, it really set the framework for the exercise of people power in Iran. It was sort of the first time in which the people realized the strength, the power that they have to, to make their will known, especially when they create these coalitions. Um, the coalition between the sort of the young activist revolutionaries the clerical establishment, which was on the side of the revolutionaries in all three of those revolutions I, I mentioned, and the business interests, the merchants. When those three get together, that's when Iran is transformed, for better or worse, but that's, that's when the transformation takes place. And I just find it both sad and ironic that the very same issues that Howard Baskerville, you know, was fighting alongside Iranians for in 1906, the, 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 the right to have a say in the decisions that rule your life, right? The, the ability to have, you know, a freedom of conscience and, and thought and belief and, and speech are the same exact 
issues that here we are, what, 116 years later, uh, that are still being fought for uh, in Iran. Um, so, you know, that's depressing, I have to say, as an Iranian, uh, but it does uh, create a lot of resonance, as you say, about this book. I, I kind of sometimes think about this book and the story that it tells as kind of the prelude for the revolution that we're now seeing once again in Iran. So let's talk about Howard Baskerville himself then. Like, who was he? Why do you compare him to Lafayette? Obviously, the the Frenchman who helps the U.S. Um, win its independence from Great Britain. Like, introduce him, and then we'll get into a, the ideas side of what makes him so interesting. Yeah. So Howard Baskerville was a 22 year old Christian missionary uh, from Nebraska, who in 1907. Uh, is assigned to go to Persia in order to teach English at a missionary school and to preach the gospel. Um, it's funny, he did not want to go to Persia. <laughs> you know, he in his missionary application, he makes it very clear that he thinks that, you know, God is calling him to uh, to promote his kingdom in China or Japan. I think that primarily has to do with the fact that he's reading all these wonderful missionary reports about how great everything is in China and how many, you know, thousands of people are coming to Christ. And he's reading these missionary reports about how beautiful Japan is, that it's sort of, you know, the, it has the temperament of the British Isles and it's gorgeous and the people are kind. And then Alongside that, he's reading these missionary reports from Persia that it's basically saying, this is the worst place on earth. Hmm. The Persians are awful. Uh, you know, the, the solid wall of Mohammedanism is unbreakable. And so despite the fact that he, you know, begs to be sent anywhere in the Far East, he gets this unenviable missionary post in Persia. And when he shows up in 1907, uh, to uh, he's assigned to the city of Tabriz in the northwest of the country. First of all, he finds out that everything that he was told was a lie. He absolutely falls in love with the country, falls in love with the culture. Uh, you know, it becomes obsessed with Persian food, uh, loves his students, uh, very quickly becomes the most popular teacher in the school. He's also the youngest teacher in the school, so I'm sure that helped a little bit. Um <laughs> You know, he's horseback riding and he's boxing and, you know, he's having the time of his life. But at the same time, he's arrived in the middle of the, the Persian constitutional revolution, this revolution to turn Iran from an absolute dictatorship to a constitutional monarchy. And he shows up, you know, just around the time in which uh, the previous Shah, the Shah who actually signed that constitution and allowed for a parliament to be elected, dies. And that the Shah's son, a man by the name of Muhammad Ali, becomes the new Shah. And he immediately launches a war against the revolution. He tears up the constitution. He rolls his Russian-made cannons to the parliament building and then destroys the building with the parliamentarians inside. And he uses his Russian trained troops to regain control over the entirety of the country, except for Tebris, the city in which Baskerville is now teaching, preaching and living. And this city, Tebris, becomes essentially the center, the, the last bastion of this uh, revolution, uh, which is at this point you know, more a civil war than anything else uh, between the Shah's uh, troops and these revolutionaries. And for a good year and a half or so, Baskerville manages to keep his head down, you know, mind his own business. He's repeatedly told by the mission that he's there to save souls, not lives, that this is not his problem or his business. He is repeatedly told by the State Department that the U.S. government can play no role whatsoever in this revolution, uh, because as a State Department memo says, quote, Islam implies autocracy. And so therefore, this revolution has no chance of succeeding. There's no such thing as Muslim democracy. So there's no way either the U.S. government or any American can support this conflict. And so he tries his best to ignore what is happening outside of his window, but he can't. 
um, he becomes gradually more and more involved in the politics of it. And then at a certain point, the Shah, un unable to uh, conquer Tabriz, changes tactics and creates a blockade of Tabriz instead and slowly starves the population to death. And it's in the midst of that horrific humanitarian crisis as, as men, women and children are, are just you know, dying on the streets of Tabriz, that Baskerville becomes activated. He just can't ignore the suffering any longer. And despite, again, repeated warnings from the church and from the U.S. government, he quits his job as a teacher. He leaves his post as a missionary. He ultimately abandons his American citizenship and he joins the revolution in order to free this city from uh, the tyranny of the Shah. And, you know, as the subtitle. Yeah, I was going to uh, say, no danger. Gives spoiler it away. Yeah, yeah. It's, not, it's not a spoiler. Uh, he he dies in that fight. But his death becomes a real rallying cry for the revolutionaries. They ultimately do manage to break the blockade and they march all the way from Tabriz to Tehran and fling the Shah off of his throne, send him into exile, re establish the constitution, rebuild the parliament. They have new elections. And the very first legislative act of that new parliament is to declare this young, you know, evangelical Christian missionary from uh, the Midwest of the United States to be a hero and a martyr in the cause of freedom in Iran. And that's what he remained for, for really generations, really right up until 1979. Most Iranians knew who Howard Baskerville was. He was a, a prominent historical figure. I mean, there were, as I say in the book, when I was a kid in Iran, there were schools named after him. There are actually still to this day, a couple of streets in Tehran that are named Baskerville. Um, there's coffee shops, <laughs> you know, called Howard Baskerville, despite the fact that Nine out of 10 Iranians, certainly anyone under the age of 50 uh, has probably never heard of him anymore. His name has really been wiped from the collective memory of Iranians since the 79 revolution. But of course, it, despite the fact that his name was wiped from memory in Iran, his name was never in memory in America. This mm -hmm. is literally the first biography ever written about this incredibly heroic figure um, who deserves to be known. Yeah, it's it's interesting the way we if we're taught about Iran's history at all in you know high school or something it will start in 1953. Maybe there'll be a reference to conferences lucky, yeah. during World War II, but it really just starts 1940 onwards. You're not really learning about 1906. Something that I'd love to reflect on because I think this is where this gets really complicated, especially let's say reading or writing this book now versus let's say in 2003 is just like the Woodrow Wilson aspect of this. So something you, you've you spoken about, you did a good publisher's weekly um, interview is the relationship between Baskerville's engagement with Wilsonian thought pre-World War II. Obviously like Woodrow Wilson mm -hmm. is an acclaimed scholar, president of Princeton. Talk about that angle of things. Yeah, so Woodrow Wilson was, while Baskerville was getting his degree in Christian ministry at Princeton, he arrived <clears throat> in uh, 1903, which was, um, I think, I want to say a year before Woodrow Wilson had become the, the president of, of Princeton. He'd been professor of politics for many, many years, the most popular professor uh, at Princeton. Um, but when he becomes president of uh, Princeton University, he, you know, enacts this kind of absolute educational revolution, uh, uh, the, the ripples of which I think most university students in America, just whether they know it or not, have benefited from. I mean, I always kind of joke that if you took electives in college, you should thank Woodrow Wilson for it, because he pretty much created the whole concept of electives, you know, courses that you have to take that are not in your chosen field of study. And instituting that process uh, it, at Princeton is how Baskerville got to know him because after two years of burying his nose in the Bible and studying all the things that you have to do to get a degree in Christian ministry, his junior year, he had to take electives. 
And so he takes two electives with Woodrow Wilson, and those electives are in jurisprudence and in government. And as you rightly say, you know, Woodrow Wilson is correctly celebrated for essentially birthing what we now know as international law. <laughs> you know, he his conception of an international world order, which obviously culminates in the creation of the League of Nations, the precursor to the United Nations, um, and his... Uh, leadership in uh, 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 winning the First World War, all of these things uh, are remarkable. I mean, he had an expansive view of freedom and democracy as something that was uh, the birthright of all peoples everywhere. You know, he he really truly believed that uh, democracy was a divine gift and that every every person everywhere uh, has the sort of uh, God-given uh, duty to fight for freedom, and that it's the responsibility of Americans, by the way. That was his big message. It's the responsibility of Americans to make sure that that call for freedom around the world is answered. And yet, <laughs> you can't talk about Woodrow Wilson without acknowledging that he went to his grave in a despicable unrepentant racist. I mean, this is a man who long after the Civil War was was done, was an avid supporter of the Confederacy. His family owned slaves, um, not like his, you know, grandfather, you know, but he grew up owning slaves. Um, and, you know, he he as president of of Princeton, he refused to follow the example of the rest of the Ivy Leagues and allow admission to black students. And when asked why, his answer was because it would be embarrassing to them and to Princeton. Uh, you know, this is a guy who, you know, he, he, he actually screened birth of a nation at the White House. He is to this day credited with essentially ridding all of Washington, D.C., the entire federal government of its black workforce uh, when he became president. And so it's just, it's hard to reconcile. You know, he's a complicated man. You know, on the one hand, sort of like lofty idealism about the rights and privileges of all human beings. And on the other hand, just an outright explicit racist against black people. Um, but he did have this outsized influence on Howard Baskerville. Those two classes that he took with him absolutely changed Baskerville's life. It's why when he graduated from Princeton, rather than go back to South Dakota where his family was and, and do what his father and grandfather did, which was become a country preacher, he decided at least for a little while, he's going to go out into the world. And he's going to go out there with this kind of Wilsonian idea of the fusing of religion and politics. Um, and it, I'm sure that, you know, as he's walking around Tabriz, witnessing with his own eyes a revolution that he had only read about in history books, right? Seeing in, in practice what Wilson had talked about in theory, that that those words were echoing in his in his head and had a huge uh, part to play with why he made this incredibly fateful decision to abandon everything and join the revolution on behalf of a cause that wasn't his and a, and a people that he barely knew and a country that, you know, wasn't his. You know, when you tell the story of Woodrow Wilson that way, you bring to mind the fact that he seems to be the perfect example of middle ground we could find when it comes to reassessing American political figures. Founding fathers own slaves. A lot of people own slaves. Therefore, do you judge people by the standards of the time? But Woodrow Wilson was out of step with the time. Absolutely. This is the time where Theodore Roosevelt was inviting, inviting a Black man to dine in the White House. This is the time when, to your point, other Ivy Leagues are in letting black people enroll, the fact that he was out of step, even when judged by the standards of the 1900s, I think that's what places him like just unabashedly on the side of 
okay, it's fair to cancel this person <laughs> to put it really, to put it yeah. really, really aggressively. Um, I think a, a follow-up question I want to ask you though, and this is what I'm interested in when it comes to Woodrow Wilson's thought, everything you're articulating when you're referencing democracy, human rights, if we were to have this conversation, let's say during the 1990s or even 2002, that conversation would, especially in the context of the Middle East, would be on a totally different valence than mm -hmm. post Iraq, that version of the conversation, especially when once it's revealed that Iraq doesn't have weapons of mass destruction, the Bush administration, yeah. and explicitly in President Bush's second inaugural address, pivots the case for the war on terror to this very explicitly Wilsonian, quasi evangelical. U.S. has the responsibility to make the world safe for democracy, beyond even the sense that FDR would frame that during World War II. So can you reckon with having this conversation now? It seems like Howard Baskerville is like the best case scenario for <laughs> yeah. talking about these ideas. It seems that 2006, George W. Bush speeches are the worst case scenario. Yeah. You know, it's funny because you're right. Uh, Iraq changed everything. I mean, I remember the conversations that we were having about the importance of democracy promotion, you know, in the world. And Iraq changed everything, not just because it turned out that that war was fought uh, under uh, false pretenses, perhaps even fabricated pretenses, um, but also because it put lie to the notion that American foreign policy is predicated upon the rights and privileges of people around the world. That's nonsense. And everybody knows that American foreign policy is predicated on American national interests and nothing else, literally nothing else. And so one thing that we have known for, you know, really since the 60s and 70s is that democracy is in other countries is not good for America, that <laughs> it becomes very difficult to control populations. It's funny that you mentioned Iraq. Uh, let's let's go back to 2002, because I mean, it's hard to it's hard to remember that so much has happened in the last 20 years. But if you recall, the countries that supported the war in Iraq, and what I mean by supported is actually gave us airspace and, you know, land space in order to uh, effectively launched that invasion were uh, countries like, you know, Saudi Arabia or the UAE, you know, autocratic regimes. The one country that said no was Turkey. Why? Because Turkey is a democracy. And so they had to vote and they voted no. And all of a sudden you, you understand, oh, you know, maybe democracy isn't that great when it comes to American national interests. I think the difference, of course, is that there's a there's there's sort of U.S. government policy and interests on one hand, mm -hmm. and then there is the actual legitimate thirst and desire for freedom and popular sovereignty on the other, and. There are some very basic things that the American government can do when it comes to promoting the rights of those individuals that has nothing to do, certainly with invasion, but has nothing to do with um, even America's policy interests. There are economic incentives that we can give. I mean, let's take a look at what's happening in Iran. Part of the problem is that four decades of sanctions, isolation, and containment has created a situation whereby the Iranian people have no choice but to rely on the tyrants that rule them for their most basic needs. And so why is it that revolutions haven't, until right now, and hopefully this one will, haven't managed to really change the situation? Because changing the situation means you may not have bread tomorrow. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that, again, to your point, there's a difference between an individual who says that in the name of what it means to be American, frankly, in the name of what it means to be Christian, I am going to fight for the rights of other people. Um, and the American government setting its foreign uh, policy interests based on this kind of idea that what we really want to do is promote democracy. By the way, 
you know, we're talking 20 years ago. Today, the situation is far more uh, ridiculous and, and uh, uh, fam- frankly, macabre, right? Like, I mean, nowadays, if you talk about democracy promotion anywhere in the world, uh, you get laughed out of the room. <laughs> you know, we're not all that fond of democracy in America right now. Uh, there are large swaths of the American uh, public that uh, aren't, you know, so all that supportive about democracy, even here in the United States, let alone elsewhere. And so really what Baskerville does is it, he, he forces us to look at ourselves and say, what do we actually believe? I mean, are these universal rights or not? And if they are universal rights, what are we willing to do to make sure that people everywhere have access to the same rights and privileges that we take for granted here in the United States. What is our obligation to the stranger, if you will? Um, those are questions that have always animated me, you know, mm-hmm. existentially. Um, and there are questions that Baskerville forces us to confront. You know, it's interesting then that kind of takes us to two central conflict hotspots. So you always have China and Taiwan and the Asia Pacific, and then you have Ukraine. What makes both those countries slash territories in the case of Taiwan interesting is there's a very national interest based focus you can make on it. So you could say, Mm -hmm. well, the reason why we need to back Ukraine is because we don't want Russia to own the breadbasket of Europe. We need to protect our allies who we have treaties with. In the case of Taiwan, you could talk about semiconductors and microchips. You don't have to even and start military with, bases. And yeah. military, you, you don't have to talk about Japan. Well, yeah, exactly. Philippines. You don't you don't have to start with democracy. But I, I do think in in both cases, the democracy part is actually important. Um I, I think deeply for on, on, on a personal level. Um, the case there, but also I think I think it speaks to, I think it speaks to the part of a, kind of the global debate you're having right now. How, how would you reflect upon like the way I just articulated that? No, I think that's beautifully put. And uh, you know, we obviously have a very selective idea of you know who we support and who we don't support. So yes, democracy in Taiwan because it it serves our interests. Yes, democracy in Ukraine because it serves our our interests. Uh, democracy in Palestine? No, not really. Does not serve our interests to allow those people to have a say uh, in you know the kind of government that they're going to have. Um, it, it's hard. I think because of that, it's it's hard to ignore you know the the hypocrisy behind the way that we selectively decide which democratic uh, movements we are going to support and which we don't. But again, I think uh, forget about that. It, 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 this is a this is a question for for us Americans as individuals, not as a nation, not as a government, um, because it doesn't you know it doesn't have to be. Uh, you know, Baskerville was willing to sacrifice his life for the freedom of other people. That's not what we're talking about, right? But we are talking about empathy and sympathy and interest and focus, um, those things are valuable as well. And where are we putting our empathy and our focus? It's easy to empathize with the Ukrainians, frankly. Um, Why is it so hard to empathize with Palestinians? You know? I, I think the question then though would be, what is a government supposed to do with, I think, the tension you're exposing. So something you've, you've also written about is the fact that, you know, the United States, like as a, as a, as a country, as, as a people, is actually very popular um, with the Iranian people. Absolutely. However, the, the Iranian government, as it's constituted, is like quite literally, and I think justifiably articulated as like our enemy. Um, mm-hmm. They are backing Russia and Ukraine. They obviously um, played a very interesting role in Iraq post-2004. Mm-hmm. Um, all those different things you could articulate, the conflict in Syria. What do we do with the notion that people and government are separate, right? Like if, if you're a policymaker listening yeah. to this, what are you supposed to do with that reality? 
Yeah, you know, we used to make that whole joke about how jazz won the Cold War or like rock and roll, like won the Cold yeah, War. Jeans, you know? rock and roll. And yeah, jeans, yeah, exactly. And I don't know why we have forgotten about the importance of soft power. Um, you know, I'm I am severely critical of American foreign policy towards Iran, not because I think that Iran, the Iranian government is not a force for bad in the world. It is unquestionably a force for bad in the world. There's no question that America and Iran in most cases, have uh, you know conflicting national security interests, um, certainly in that region. But what is it that we want to do? Are we trying to punish the Iranian government, or are we trying to empower the Iranian population? Because those are different things. Mm -hmm. And right now, we have this kind of maximum pressure policy that has resulted in profound suffering for the Iranian people, but has only further entrenched, you know, the regime in power. Uh, as I said before, you know, I make this this comment in the book about how a tyrant stays in power by isolating his people. And we have done the tyrants work for him uh, when it comes to Iran. But there are a number of issues that don't make any sense. For instance, the sanctions that we have put on social media, Internet access, those kinds of things. I mean, if you want true change, let's say your goal is regime change in Iran. Let's say that's your goal. OK, for 40 years, you've tried to create regime change by sanctioning and isolating and containing and nothing has happened at all. But it, instead, what you've done is you've you've disempowered the population to actually have the kind of access they need to the free marketplace of ideas necessary to actually truly have the ability to rise up and change their government. Um, let's talk about uh, the WTO. I mean, again, I can think of a million examples, but I'm just throw throw yeah. another thing out that shows how ridiculous this is. Iran has been for a decade and a half desperate to join the World Trade Organization. And for a decade and a half, the United States has vetoed the possibility of doing that as a way of, again, punishing the government for its bad behavior. You want to punish the government for its bad behavior? Allow it to join the WTO. Because membership in the World Trade Organization requires a certain level of uh, commitments to standards, uh, standards of, of you know, economic policy, openness to free markets, uh, the the sort of uh, uh, healthy competition, no monopolies, all of that stuff, if Iran is forced to do, will necessarily open up the country even more, empower the population even more. So you're not punishing the, the government by refusing to allow it to join the WTO. And by the way, this is the other thing about the WTO is that if you violate those things, then you can be kicked out. The problem with our foreign policy with Iran right now is that there is no carrot. You know, Iran has no incentive to change its behavior because there's nothing we can take away from Iran anymore, right? But let's say they're part of the WTO. The threat that, hey, if you do not lay off the population right now that is begging for its most basic rights, then we'll throw you out of the WTO. Now that's a threat, right? That's actually a reason for Iran to moderate its behavior. But what incentive does the government have right now to moderate its behavior? What, more sanctions? You know, it's just, it's a foolish, foolish policy predicated not on changing Iran, which is what is everyone's goal, but on just punishing it for its, you know, bad acts. Well, that hasn't gotten us anywhere in 40 something years. And I don't see it, you know, changing if we continue that policy. So two things. So firstly, I'd love to hear your response to, because I know audience members who are like more China hawkish are going to be screaming this. They would say, well, look, Reza, I get what you're saying, but we let China into the WTO in the, in the 2000s under many of the same articulations yes. you made. Mm -hmm. And it just turns out that regime type matters when you have a Chinese communist party, when you have an Ayatollah, 
at the end of the day, it's just possible that you'll end up empowering the regime with these resources, but you won't get the possibility of democratic change that you're describing here. So I'm curious how you would respond to that counter. Yes, and I and I I've heard that argument before, and it's a it's a valid argument. But what I will say this is that if you look at the history of the 20th century, what you can say with some measure of confidence is that a country, when it has some form of representative government plus access to the free market economy, often what that uh, equals is some kind of national success. China has access to the free market economy, but it has nothing even resembling a representative government. There are no, there's no representative government of any kind in China. So access to the free market economy, only all it did was further uh, enrich and empower the oligarchy that uh, controls that country. Iran is far more complicated than that. Iran has mm -hmm. two governments. Yeah, you know, it, it it has, of course, it, it's like a split government, and some people understand this. It has a representative government, a, an elected president, a uh, an elected parliament that like debates laws, uh, a, an independent, independent. That's the wrong term for it. A judiciary. A judiciary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> pardon me. A judiciary uh, that interprets those laws and a robust political culture. Right. That. On, on off years, get 60%, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, participation in, in elections. Now, of course, as all Iran watchers will say is, yeah, but that representative government has on top of it, this unrepresented government, which is the, you know, the supreme leader that we had talked about, who is the commander in chief of the military, who can veto any law that parliament passes, who can dismiss the president at his whim, uh, who can uh, certainly, you know, uh, put aside any judgment made by the judiciary. All of that is correct. But at the very least, Iran has had four and a half decades of an experience of representative government and has on occasion really used that access to uh, representation to make significant changes in Iran, um, whether it's the, you know, the Khatami years or the, the you know, Rouhani years, whatever the case may be, um, and of course in the legislature as well. What it doesn't have is the other end of it. Mm -hmm. So in other words, it's like the opposite of the China uh, argument, right? China got free market economy, but it never had a representative government. I Iran does have a tradition of a representative government that can occasionally uh, enforce its will, uh, even on the clerical regime, frankly, but it has no access to the free market economy. I don't want to be glib about this, but revolutions are fought and won by the middle class not by the poor, you know? And right now, there's hardly a middle class to speak of in Iran. I mean, you know, certainly not in the sense of a leisure class. There's no leisure class in Iran. Again, half the population is under the poverty line. Being middle class means you've got four jobs. Um, it takes a moment like we're seeing now, a moment of absolute despair and desperation to get people out onto the streets. Um, but, you know, uh, uh, and, and again, I, I understand all the arguments against it, but I do think that the Iran situation provides precisely the framework necessary to see how the mobilization of a middle class, access to the rest of the world, uh, uh, you know, a, a interdependent trade relationship that then can be used to enforce proper behavior on the global stage. All of those things can work in Iran in a way that they don't necessarily need to work in a behemoth like China. Yeah, I I love that response from you just because it, it helps you just sort of get at, in a way, kind of the critique you can make of the free market China articulation in the 1990s and that free markets are not just, you know, manna from heaven or seedlings right. that you could just drop onto things. And all of a sudden everything. you have yeah. village councils and then it's, uh, you know, democratic China and everything's good to go. Um, no offense, Thomas Friedman. Um, but basically, <laughs> yeah. you know, I, I think that the last two questions I want to have here is one, 
if I'm hearing what you're saying, if I were to, if I were to articulate what a, a more hawkish person on Iran would say, to your point about punishing the regime, choking the country, it would basically be that, let's assume this person is operating in good faith. Look, as a post-Arab spring, I am incredibly skeptical that democratic change, revolutions, et cetera, will either abound in the name of democracy, look at you know Egypt, or to US national interest. We would be giving up both Sorry, we'd be making a gamble in two things that wouldn't actually come about. How how should folks who are suffering a hangover, not merely from the Iraq war, but from the dashed optimism of 2011, how should they think of what you're describing? I don't think that we should ignore the role that the United States played in the, the dashed optimism of 2011 um, or in Iraq in 2009. I think that especially when you look at like let's just let's use the example of the jcpoa the the so-called iran nuclear uh deal um hassan rouhani the previous president of iran and you can whatever you want to say about him okay he's a cleric and he was sort of you know one of a handful of vetted candidates but he represented a vision of iran that was far more in alignment with what we in the united states want to see out of iran and he had an enormous amount of popular support, and he did uh, uh, unquestionably and explicitly make certain promises about um, social norms and behaviors. It's precisely what we're seeing now is because the you know during the Rouhani years the morality police more or less went away, you know, and now with Ibrahim Raisi, this absolutely hard line, frankly. A man who belongs in the ICC, not you know in, in the president's office in Iran, um, he he's the one who has redoubled the the focus of the, on the morality police, etc., leading to these revolutions, etc. But what what Rouhani basically said was, "Vote for me, and I will get this nuclear deal in place." And I will open up the country and you'll have jobs again and you'll be able to feed your family again. You'll be able to get on the Internet again. And yes, I support the regime. I am a supporter of the situation of the of the, you know, the 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 status quo insofar as what the government is. But, you know, I'm going to give the people the, the power mm-hmm. necessary um, to actually have some of their more more basic needs met. And then. We we you know we changed presidents and we basically told Rouhani, hey, never mind. You know, all that you did, all that you said, everything that you risked, the promises that you made and the promises that were believed was all BS. And that was the moment, I think, in which what we saw, you know, what basically what we're seeing right now is that the there was the government switched from openness the possibility of reform the possibility of interdependence in some way to a government that is completely closed off now further right than it has been in at least two generations um and uh and a, and a population that is suffering profoundly for believing you know, American promises about a possibility of a different kind of relationship. So it all goes back to where this conversation started. We, we can't talk about the behavior of governments like Iran without looking at ourselves and the actions that we have done to precipitate, uh, you know, some of the some of the negative consequences that we are we are seeing right now. You know, will that change anytime soon? Probably not. <clears throat> uh, I think when it comes to Iran policy, it doesn't matter whether it's Democrat or Republican. It seems like we are more or less stuck in place right now. Um, and so the onus is on the Iranian people. Um, for generations, they've been willing to sacrifice themselves in order to change that country. And for generations, we haven't been much help. Um And so I don't know. I mean, maybe look, I get that it's a little bit Pollyannish to think that maybe a book about Howard Baskerville could change things. But I will say this, that, you know, this this kid, this Christian kid from Nebraska, 
was someone who was willing to put his faith into practice, put his beliefs into action. Uh, you know, at, near the end of his life, uh, the the um, consul general in Tabriz, the American consul general, tried one last time to to dissuade Baskerville from his current uh, course of action. And he says to him, you know, on the battlefield, this is not your fight. You're American. These people are Persian. This is not your country. This is not your fight. And Baskerville very famously says, the only difference between me and these people is the country of my birth. And that is not a very big difference. I just wish that as Americans, we could remember that, right? That there isn't that much that separates us, you know, from Iranians, except that we were born here and they were born there. But our wishes and our hopes and our desires, our dreams, our aspirations, our struggles, you know, our rights <laughs> are, are, you know, to quote uh, uh, Woodrow Wilson, our God-given rights are the same. And so what are you going to do about that? Does that matter to you? Does it, is it important? Or is it just <clears throat> something to ignore and, and, you know, go back to seeing what like, you know, Ben Affleck and JLo are up to? You know, we'll, we'll close there, but I think given, I, I think I better understand what you're really saying here after hearing that last anecdote, because the interesting, and this is why Howard's a good person to profile is the question is, what do you like as an individual American citizen think about that? Because obviously the U.S. government on 15 different levels cannot treat an Iranian the same way as they treat an American. Like that's right. a basic thing. But at a, at, a, at a deeply personal level, I think bringing that perspective there and seeing it through Howard's eyes is an interesting way to think about the challenges we're facing. So Reza, this has been really great. Would love for you just because we're closing the episode to shout out the book specifically, the title, give the spoiler, but what happens obviously, but then we'll close out there. <laughs> yes. So the book is called An American Martyr in Persia, The Epic Life and Tragic Death of Howard Baskerville. It's actually the first bi biography ever written about uh, Howard Baskerville. And uh, I, it's a story... <clears throat> That not just has a lot of historical resonance, as we've discussed, but I do think that it's the kind of story that um, Americans especially need to read for the very questions that you were asking. What is our responsibility to people that we don't know, that we don't have a connection to? Um, what are you willing to do to, to help someone, you know, who doesn't look like you or pray to the same God as you? Or have the same color as you. Uh, that's a question that I think is, you know, at this point right now, probably the most important question we could ask ourselves as human beings. Reza, thank you for joining me on The Realignment. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. 